definitely a learning curve. It does. Definitely you have to change the whole world. we get ready for worship here this morning. We want to bring to your attention a few things that we have going on around here. And if you look out in the foyer, there is a blue tote, that uh, blue bucket there that is part of the family network. If you don't know about them, they have been the ones that have really been helping us get diapers here to give out to those in our community that need it on every first and third Wednesday of the month. And so what we're doing is for the next three weeks, we're having a diaper drive. And if you can bring a box of diapers, whatever you can do to bring to this diaper drive and put it in that blue bucket, you can't miss it. It's teal blue, it's bright. You'll see it out there and put it in there. We would greatly appreciate it as we support another ministry that supports us and so uh, we got men's meeting this thursday at 5 30. we've been doing them on tuesday mornings but we have changed them to thursday at 5 30 in the morning and then also as you can see there were some vendors out there and uh, you may be wondering what it's about so they were at our women's conference and we had multiple vendors there but these are vendors that go to our church and so we wanted to support them and show them love and so yes give them a round of applause for being here at the conference and and making it seem so great and man they just did awesome out there and so go support them and support their businesses we're a supporting church right and so support their businesses there and uh lastly we want to say thank you thank you thank you this women's conference this weekend was superb and everything was so great it was smooth and it couldn't have been done without the volunteers and the helpers so we had a planning committee and that was mallory haney michelle dennis ann shackleford uh, sister beth curtis and debbie crouch and tammy sizemore i want to say thank you to them there was a lot of planning involved and that was a lot of what made this conference Happen. Also, we had Marty House, and she was emceeing the whole thing, and she did a fantastic job in that. Kelly Isham, if you know Kelly's around, you know there's going to be some what? good food, some good food. So she took care of all of that. We had Roxanne take care of the speaker. Pastor Shane took care of the worship and had all that going. And, of course, Pastor Steve and 
Mo and uh, all of them just pouring in and doing it and all the volunteers. We want to say thank you because it was a, a success. And I know he's being a little bit humble, but there's someone pretty close to him that was a visionary for this. We thank Caitlin, his wife, for having the vision to set this on. Amen. And we want to thank all of you for praying because it was a wonderful weekend. Yeah, and we're going to encourage you. If you didn't get to be at it this year, we are doing it again next year. And we expect bigger and greater things than what happened this year because God is in it. And God is moving, so we're going to encourage you to be a part of that. Let's lift our hands in worship and let's pray and see God real fast. Lord, we thank you, God, for what you're doing in this church, God. We are a church that loves you and wants to serve your body. And we thank you, God, for allowing us to be a part of your kingdom, God. And we ask that as we lift up your name, God, you encourage our hearts this morning and let us receive from you. In your name we pray. Amen.
need somebody in here that's not going to be concerned about what's going to happen next. I need somebody in here that's going to give God their unadulterated praise. There is nothing but pure love and adoration and glory for God. It's not mixed. You don't have a side partner. You don't have a side God. You only have one Lord and Savior. He is the King of Kings. I want you to give Him. God gives us this promise draw near to me and I will draw near to you I'm gonna ask our team to come up here and join together with you in prayer we ask in the name of Jesus and whatever we ask in faith he says believe it and you shall have it I think sometimes we want to water down the words of Christ I think we want to give him an out just in case something doesn't happen he said in faith believe that you will receive and you will have it I need somebody in here that would say I am not going to back up on my faith I'm going to go to God for whatever I need. I, I'm going to go to God for my family. I'm going to go to God for my future. I'm going to go to God for my health. You come right now and let him bring light into your dead situation. Let him bring life into your dead situation in Jesus' name.
The words of our Savior says, and how much more does he love giving good gifts to us? Can we just say thank you? Can we just say thank you right now? God has moved right here and blessed and signs and wonders are following the believers. Amen. Amen. He is faithful. He is worthy. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I want you to try to remember this phrase. I want you to say it with me. Say, God's got me down pat. I'm going to say it again. God's got me down pat. Now, what PAT stands for, this acrostic, is power, authority, and timing. He has the power. He's given you the authority, his authority, and there is a time for you to move and to work throughout this entire service, throughout this week. We have seen at just the right time God has worked. Would you wait on him right now? Would you be willing to wait? Heavenly Father, touch us now.
climbed up in a tree and he was wanting to see Jesus. He just wanted to be able to see him. He was not trying to get his attention. He was just wanting to see him. But in that moment, God stopped. How many knows Jesus is God? God stopped and said, I got to pull you out of the crowd and I got to do something just for you. There's a moment like this happening. I'm going to ask Amy Watson to stand up here and, and she is going to make this call and we are going to agree together for someone. Roger, would you and Linda come to the front? I don't mean to pull you out, but... I have to obey God because I failed you yesterday. And when you and I were working in the kitchen together, you you went into just very minor details of some issues that were going on and asked me, would I, me and Greg be willing to help pray? And at that moment, I should have stopped everything I was doing and 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 pray for you. And I'm very bad about doing that because sometimes I don't, I don't speak adequately or I don't pray, you know, just in all these big words and don't know really what to do. But when the Lord laid something on my heart and then when I was getting ready for church this morning, he reminded me of where I failed yesterday and wasn't obedient. So you have got an army that is surrounding you. And... The Lord is going to take care of all of this. Physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever, all that's going on. Because I don't have any details, but I do know that we are to pray for you. In an agreement in this whole congregation, we are to lift your arms up. And so I just want you um, <laughs> to come around and um, pray. Hold their arms up. And begin to call out for them. God, we believe. We believe right now, Jesus. Come on, church, this is intercessory prayer. It needs to come out of your mouth from the back to the front. Don't just think your prayer, speak your prayer. Hallelujah. Come on, speak your prayer right now. Pray for them right now. Call their names out. Roger, Linda, call them out right now. Hallelujah. God, we love you. We thank you for your healing power. Let them go from this place leaping and praising God because they are changed and transformed and healed, delivered in the name of Jesus. Glory! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. your hands real high your praise and your worship the enemy has tried to squander over the past year and a half 
but there is a spirit inside of you that was raised up by Christ himself from the dead. And you are going to stretch forth a praise with courage, with boldness, with intensity, with passion. Woman of God, never again do you have any right, listen to me as your spiritual father, to pull up past, to rehearse trouble. You are a Zion woman. And when Zion travails, new things are born. New things are born. Let it be in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Mm. Holy, 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 holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The Bible says God is spirit, Roger. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The enemy's tried to attack your mind. He's tried to bring anxiety and trouble that seems to come out of nowhere. You're not trying to drum it up. You're not trying to dramatize anything. It comes out, it seems, out, out, of, out of just suddenness. But I'm telling you right now, the spirit that God's placed in you, the song that he's put inside your heart needs to be heard. And I'm going to tell you, the enemy's trying to squander it and silence your praise. Man of God, rise up, rise up man of God. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And if he did it for Zacchaeus, he'll do it for you. I need some people in here that'll just be bold enough that you'll fight through your fear and say, I am tired of being overcome. I want you to raise your hand. I, want, I am tired of being overcome. Look here. Keep your hand up. I am tired of being, pick me, God. I am tired of being overcome. Don't pass me by, God. If you don't, if I don't know if you hear me, I'm going to yell a little bit louder. I'm not going to resist. I'm also not going to shy away. I need your overcoming power. Now I want you to raise that other hand, and I want you to receive the power that comes from on high. Jesus said that in that same time, you shall be endued with power from on high. You are not to be overcome, but to be an overcomer by the word, by the blood of the lamb, and by the word of your testimony. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now, those of you that are watching online and maybe you're new here, this is not sensationalism. This is not emotionalism. This is spiritualism. This is the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost moving among us and speaking to us now. And I, I'm telling you, when you walk back to your place, whatever, whatever you come up with here, leave it right here. Leave it right here in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody give a shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. Give a shout.
say his name is power his name is healing his name is life he breaks every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a come on give the lord a praise Come on, give him a praise in this house. Hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. Well, glory. Amen. Well, you got the appetizer. You better not fill up on all of that Outback Steakhouse bread because the word of life is going to be brought in this house right now. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. In just a minute, you will hear from Christy Overton Johnson. And many of you are are going to realize that her ministry may have already or could be impacting your family just real soon. Over the course of the last seven to ten days, the last week, from Arizona to Little Rock, some where men and women incarcerated heard the word of God. In just a moment, there's a video that you will watch that will introduce her. And you're going to learn about who she is. But the truth of the matter is, you're going to be revealed today about who God is through her. And let me give you this stat. There's a lot that she, she'll share with you. But just yesterday... No more than three miles to our north at the correction facility just up the road from the square where the women are. Fourteen ladies gave their heart to God under her ministry yesterday. Amen. That's our people. She has logged many hours, many miles. I'm going to ask you to stretch your right hand toward her right now. And I want you to pray for a refreshing in her body and her mind and her spirit. This is the woman of God for us today. And we thank God that he has crossed our path with her. So now bring, pray healing and refreshing in her body. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the woman of God that you have for us today. We thank you for the word that she is going to share. Open up our hearts and ears. Lord, I pray, God, that we would hear your word and respond to it. But right now, rejuvenate her body, mind, and spirit in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. amen. Take a look on the screen. Set by Christy Overton, 4,770 points. Christy Overton, the reigning World Junior Girls overall champion. Overton is also the current world junior slalom and jump champion, and certainly the best junior girl skier in the world, bar none. Christy enjoying slalom could spell uh, bad news for a competitor. Look at that easily again, a solid run at 40 feet for Christy. So the new kid on the block is done and Wayne. Christy Overton, on her first pro start, has won the championship of the women's slalom. 
At Christy, age 19, has reason to smile, and you'll see a lot of her on the pro tour throughout this summer. Side. Here comes Christy Overton. She needs to get past two buoys. Wonderful start. A little slow number two, but she didn't want to push it too much, and she's there. Yeah. For Christy Overton, skiing the best of her career right now. Recently engaged to be married. She says she wants the money, and she wants this Masters title. Going for back-to-back -back titles as she gets all the way around number four. She does on her onside sails to victory and continues to have a very easy go at short line slalom. Here's the magic run, tour title and an event victory if she can get past four at 38 off. Oh, good start. Look at this. Good tight line at number two. Oh, she's in great shape. And she's got four, there's the tie, and there's the win. She got around the fifth buoy, but she's going for more. She runs the whole pass. She was just um, fierce, and that's probably the best way to describe her. And now, even in her life after skiing, she's still incredibly fierce, but now she's really fierce for God, and she's really doing some fantastic things. And I think her desire to be number one on the water has led right into her desire in the ministry to be God's number one. She took on the role of understanding that you know, what she did on the water and what she has and what she's been given was all blessings from God. She found an opportunity that the blessing she had to be able to reach people through water skiing and being on the water was a way that she could build a bridge to connect to people. I've been so blessed this morning. I, I, I laugh at myself because as I watch that, I start stretching my neck and massaging my shoulders because they start remembering what that felt like. And that was a long time ago. I spent 35 years on the waters uh, of the world. I started water skiing when I was four years old, started competing when I was five. And by the age of eight, I was traveling across the country, turned um, professional at the age of 13, and it was all I ever knew. It's what our family did together. Uh, my father had a water sports magazine, a marine magazine called Overton's. It was a catalog, and it would go all over the world, and so we kind of supported each other. I'd wear Overton's and have it on my ski, and of course, he supported me uh, financially. He even went so far as to build me my own lake when I was 11 years old. And I did not know that was odd. At the time, I thought everybody had a lake in their backyard, but he, it wasn't. My parents made so many incredible sacrifices. And it was only until I was a parent myself, you saw three of my children up there. I have one more daughter that did not make that picture because she just came to us about four years ago, and that video is pretty old. Um, I have a biological son, Ty, that you saw. He lives in Arizona. He's 26. Two uh, adopted children from Russia that are now 23 and 21. And a young lady from the Ukraine who's 21 who we welcomed him to our home in 2020 to get some medical uh, attention through the Shriners Hospital. And as you know, 2020 was a crazy year. And then the war broke out there, and there was nowhere for her to go back to. So she is now uh, a permanent member of the Johnson household, too. So it's really interesting. You know, you see wars going on between Russians and Ukrainians, and we have two Russians and a Ukrainian in our home, and it just works out just fine. 
And so I just want to thank you for your warm welcome. I want to thank you, uh, Pastor Steve and Pastor Beth. Thank you for having me here, for the support that you guys give to our prison ministry every month. Thank you. And I want to thank my armor bearers. We didn't have the armor bearers in the Baptist church. So thank you. They have not let me lift a finger, and he even leaned over, can I help you up the steps? And I said, yes, you may. It's very odd for me. Um, Frank calls me an independent woman. But it's because I traveled all over the world by myself, lugging a six-foot, seven-foot ski bag that my son, because a lot of times my husband would stay home to work, and so it would be me and my son, and he would ride my ski bag <laughs> through the airport, and I'm going like that, and I had to learn to get doors with my feet and put keys in with my mouth and keep up with my kid, and it's just the way it's been. And so they told me I'm going to have to be trained. And I said, oh, evidently you need to train my husband. <laughs> because I'm all about you carrying my bag. So, I, you know, it's okay. Um, that does not bother me one bit. So thank you. They met me in... They're wonderful. Thank you. And so I landed here from Arizona. I live in North Carolina. That's why I talk with a twang. So I lived in, I live in North Carolina. I spent 32 years in Florida because that's where water skiers go to train year-round. Everybody that wants to water ski at some time ends up from all over the world in Orlando, West Palm area. Um, and then there's some on the West Coast, but even the West Coasters come down because that's it's warm. And that was the thing in North Carolina, you just... It got cold, just like here. Very similar weather to here. I did get to spend some time on Lake D. Gray growing up and stayed over in Hot Springs. And I trained with uh, my, one of my coaches, Kyle Tate, the Tate family, and um, was able to go and spend a lot of time trailering boats through those windy roads. And so I'm so thankful to be here. Got to go on the university yesterday and see the hogs. And that was all Danny wanted me to see. So we, we did get that checked off. So I am so grateful to be here for the support and for the opportunity to share what God has done in my life because it has been a journey. And that's what I want to encourage you. None of us ever arrives. It's just a part of your story that's being written every single day. And if you don't know it, God's not done with your story. He is still, it's like a comma after everything. It's one big run-on sentence, and, and he's just adding to it, and it just gets better and better and better. That doesn't mean it gets easier. It just means it gets better. I believe in Ephesians 3.20, God, that says, I am a God that can do abundantly more than you can ever hope for or imagine. I believe in a God that if we step out, he's going to catch us. I believe now in a God that he's for me, not against me. I didn't understand that growing up in the church. I sat in pews every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, Wednesday night. When I go into the ladies and the men's facilities across the nation, I say, my drug problem is I was drugged to church. <laughs> Some of you kids over there, y'all might say, yeah, I got the same drug problem. They're dragging me to church every, every weekend too. And I'm grateful I really am, but the, the problem was I heard about Jesus so much, but I didn't understand who he was. I came to the altar almost every weekend because I never felt received by the Lord. I never felt truly saved. I never felt like I had done enough. I was afraid to step out with God because, honestly, I was afraid of what he might ask me to give up and where he might take me. I was afraid of letting go of all the accolades. And God really wasn't asking me to let go of water sports. He had given me that talent. He had given me an ability to compete and to travel the world and to build relationships and to be kind and be the hands and feet of Jesus. But what I was after was bringing you know, trophies home in my hands. And so I was afraid that if I invited God in, he would just usher everything out when he really wanted to just come into that. And I thought of this, and I, I said this this morning, I said, I knew that God should always be top priority, but to me that meant 
It was always about an action. Get up in the morning, say your prayers, check, God first. Read your Bible, check, God first. And then I would get up and I would go be a wife or a mother or I'd go train. And God's like, no, it's not God then these things. It's God in these things. Especially your ministry. I learned that one the hard way. I'm type A and I'm a gung-ho woman. And when God had given me a call and I knew that he had chosen me to do something. And the reality is he's chosen all of us. And I took off after that calling. I never looked back. But I was doing it all in my own strength. God, in, in the end of my water ski career, and I was blessed in that sport. I was, I was a world champion, a world record holder for 18 years. Won 80 professional tour titles. And it's what I always knew. But around mid-90s, I began to have a lot of health issues and went through a lot of medical challenges. And I would, you know, a lot of them were uh, just birth defects or they were stomach issues from surgeries. And I would have a lot of scar tissue internally. And I just had five bowel obstructions, one after the other. Some were neck fusions, knee re repairs pelvis reconstructions, clavicle reconstructions. I mean, that was ski related. And so I was realizing that everything that I had built my life on was what you just saw on that screen. It was about the victories. And y'all saw the victories. But let me tell you, there was a thousand defeats behind every one of those arm fists. And the reason you throw the fist is because you know how hard, how hard you work for it. And it finally happens, and it all comes together in that moment. But that was my life. And the Bible says that a person who built the Bible actually calls it a foolish person, builds their life on sinking sand. Trophies are sinking sand. Buoys, slalom buoys, are sinking sand. A lot of times relationships, the wrong, wrong ones, are sinking sand. I was building my life on a foundation that when the rains, not if, when they come, and, and they will come for the wise and the foolish. When the rains come, when the floods rise, when the wind's blowing and howling, the one that builds his life on this, the word of God, on the Father's love, it says that if we root down in his love, if we understand how, it says in Ephesians, how what every Christian should understand is how deep and how wide and how long and how high the love of God is. And when we do that, we're rooted. When we build our life on the hope of Jesus Christ, not this wishy-washy hope of the world. I hope I get that tournament. I hope I get invited. I hope I get that trophy. I hope I get that money. I hope I get that date and that prom date. I hope I get that dress. No, it's a firm expectation a firm expectation that God's not going to fail me. That God's going to do what he says he's going to do. I didn't have that kind of hope. I didn't have that hope. Because my foundation with Christ was built on my performance. It was built on what I did for him. How many times I came to the altar. How long I cried. How bad I felt. And then how hard I served him. How many hours I spent at the church. And then at the end of my career, when I finally realized, you know, God had saved me. Not just for eternal salvation, but so that I could live a life that is worth so much more than a trophy. That he could give me contentment. That he could be my anchor of hope. So when the wind and rains come, I am secure. And that's what I discovered in all those surgeries, that I finally found the right anchor, not a boat anchor, but the anchor of truth. And so I, I stepped out in the ministry in 2003. I was at the end of my water ski career. My body was just done. And so the Lord began to work in my heart and showed me that all of that was for His glory. He had given me all those opportunities. I ask you to go into your memory bank and think about what's in your toolbox. Mine happened to be water sports. Mine were learning how to get up. 
to get to a dock when I didn't feel like it, getting off a dock when I didn't feel like it, having someone else carrying me to the dock. Like all of that stuff is now used in prisons to help people connect to the right power source, get up in life, and learn how to stay up. And when you fall, because you will, the wind's going to knock you down. I, I saw ducks over there. I've had ducks, so many ducks. You're right in the middle of a turn, and here it comes quack, quack. Bam, 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 bam. An alligator pop up. Bam, bam, bam. I mean, it's going to happen in skiing, and it's going to happen in life. But you got to know how to get up. Because God's not calling you for perfection. He's calling you to be resilient, to continue to go back and say, when that boat comes back around, when God comes back around, not wallowing in your guilt and your shame and all of that, but saying, God, I'm sorry. You're right. I should have listened. Will you forgive me? And he says, come on, baby, let's go. Let's hit it. Hit it's what I used to say to the boat driver. For 35 years, I had the opportunity to walk up to a dock, and that's half the battle, y'all. A lot of times I pay, say, get off the spiritual dock. Get off the dock of life and go. But a lot of people haven't even got to the dock. They're too tired. They're too angry. They don't trust the power source. And so they don't even come out of the house to get there. It's more comfortable to stay there. But you get to the dock, you get prepared, and you've got this decision to get into the water or to go with God. And I realized I hadn't gone anywhere with God. And all those years I sat in a pew, it was time for me to say, hit it, God. And the reason I didn't is because I didn't trust him. I was afraid if I let go of all of this, this won't going to be so much fun. I thought he would zap the life out of me. I thought for sure this, this would just take all the fun in the world. But when I started following him, getting on the dock and answering the call of God in my life, when he was saying, use all this to help people get up. Little kids, give them an experience. The at-risk youth, we started working with kids all over the country in a ministry that I founded called, non, it was a nonprofit called In His Wakes. And we do it all over the United States. We were doing it internationally. For 10 years, that, that ministry was thriving. But I wasn't letting God be the power source. One day I sat at the end of the lake at the dock and I said, God, why is serving you so hard? Wah, wah, wah. And I saw in my mind's eye a picture of a boat and me driving it. I'm hanging onto the steering wheel. And then my leg's outside the boat with the ski on it. And he says, how'd that work for you? <laughs> you know, I was a good skier, and I probably could stick my leg out and go down the lake, but that is how it works. God was saying, get out of the driver's seat and let me lead you. In the name of the ministry, I knew enough about God to know in water skiing that I named it In His Wakes. Because the safest place in the water, when you're in the boat and it gets rough, is get behind that boat wake. Let the boat pull you. Get there where it's protected and the boat's plowing the path and going through the chop for you and smoothing it out. But when I set out in ministry, I didn't follow God. I followed the call, but I didn't follow the one who had called me. Never said that before might say that again. I followed the call because I knew what God was saying to do. But I set out and just did it. I used my name in the sport to call to make things happen. And 10 years later, I had been to so many doctors. I, I share all of this in my book back there, Hit It. I, sh I just got sick, sick, sick. Why? Because I was working, working, working for God, which is not bad in itself, but for the whole purpose of trying to please God. You see, my, I had wonderful parents, wonderful parents, but you saw how happy my daddy got. Woo! He was running down the banks. My mom was happy. She was a little bit more, res she's a little, a lot bit more reserved. My dad is demonstrative, screaming, come on, baby. Oh, there he is. That was us in Italy uh, in the World Championship Parade there in Milan. Yeah, just grinning ear to ear. 
in my whole life, this is my baby. Did y'all know she's a world champion water skier? It still tells it. And I hadn't skied in 20 years. Okay, so proud papa. And there was nothing wrong with that. But what I did is I put his face, my daddy's face on God. And a lot of people do that. A lot of people do that. You had an abusive father. You put his face on God. And you're like, I'm not going near him. He's going to let me down. He's going to hurt me. We might be afraid to approach God the Father because we put our Father's face. Maybe we even knew a Father. The Father never said, I love you or you're going to amount to something. I, I had the good Father, but he still wasn't perfect. There were still things that he said sometimes that hurt. There was still a little bit of pressure, even though he didn't mean to. I just saw he's grinning ear to ear. That was me. It started young, y'all. I didn't even know we had, I forgot we had these. An amazing dad. He's, he turns 80 this year. My mom's 75. They've been married like 60 some years. And they're just beautiful. He's just so proud in the way he looks at me. And I knew that the more I won, the more degrees I had, the greater grades I made, they're going to just grin, be so proud. Now, they loved me all apart from that. Why? Because I was their daughter and their good parents. But I, I imagine that God must smile really big. And I do believe God smiles when we are serving him. That's not what I'm saying. But I believed he was only happy with me if I was going into doing this many events. If I was speaking this many times, I didn't know how to say no to anything. I got so out of balance. I imagine that if I win enough souls, there's going to be a, there are rewards in heaven. But I was like trying to earn the favor and the blessing of God by my works. And the Lord, through that vision, was saying, come to me, baby girl. You're weary. You're tired. And I'll give you rest. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 4, you've got to labor to enter the rest. Maybe it's 3. It's Hebrews 3 or 4. It talks about the rest. There is a rest for us to enter. It's where we enter into his love. He loves us not because of how long we cry or how much we wallow in our guilt. Because he showed me one day after four hours of walking and apologizing to God because I wasn't up earlier. I was already up at 5. Lord, I should have been up at 2. Three, I should have read five chapters instead of four chapters. I mean, this is what the devil does to my brain. Y'all probably think I'm crazy. It's okay. It is crazy in there sometimes. Because the devil tells me it's never enough. The other day, and this is just how he's still working. We've been going. I, this is like, I think the 17th, 18th time I've spoken since last Sunday. Going into these prisons. We all been gone a week and a half, and you women know nails don't last but so long. <laughs> Friday morning, I called my armor bearers. I said, we got to make his pit stop, boys. I got to go get these nails done because there ain't much left of them, and they're just re they're revolting. But on the way there, the devil said, God's not going to be with you this afternoon when you're sharing the word because you better have been on your knees praying should have been a little more spiritual before you walk in. It's the devil. And if you don't know this, and if you don't know your father's voice, you will buy into that 24-7. What does God say? I am with you always. What is God calling me to do? To be equipped and always be ready to give an answer. You know what we did at the nail salon? We talked about Jesus. That lady, she just starts, she goes, girl, what you doing here? And she, we had a good time. Beautiful African-American lady. We were just talking and, and she asked me where I'd been and what I do and how I ended up. And then I was able to give her the book. She wants to start a nonprofit for domestic violence. And God was just right there at the nail salon. God is in prison. It's just about being willing to be a messenger for God wherever you go, not lording it over people or beating people over the head, but loving people, opening a door for somebody and saying, have a wonderful day. 
And then even in the shoe aisle the other day, because I hit Nordstrom's rack too in Arizona, um, in between prisons. <laughs> and this lady just looked at me and I kind of said, hey, you go ahead. If you need me to move my cart, let me know. And she was like, you're very considered. I said, well, Lord says, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And we kind of laughed and she finished the verse and she says, I knew something was different. <laughs> in the shoe aisle, it wasn't these, but in the shoe aisle at Nordstrom's Rack, knew something was different. That's what God's calling us to, is to be a light. To be a light, whether you're in a prison, whether you're at your school, whether you're on the football field, a water ski lake, sitting on a dock with a competitor, you know what those girls do now? They meet me at the ministry tent or they'll come find me. And they're weeping because they're, they're, all their dreams just fell apart. And they've worked and skied all these years to be world champion and their ski just broke or a duck flew in front of them or something. And it's over. You've got to wait two more years and they know by then... You know, maybe they'll be injured or something. And I get to sit next to a portalette. We go find somewhere way away behind a portalette and we pray. And they search me out because they're like, we see you've got something that's greater than this. And that's what we get to tell the world. I get to go into prisons and say, you're chosen. The ones that the world threw away. The ones that even I forgot. So you might be wondering, how did a skier girl end up in prison? I had nonprofit, like I already told you, in his wakes, is flourishing. But because I was doing everything in my own strength, the Lord had me give it away. I asked him recently, I said, how come I don't get to do that anymore? He said, to save you from yourself. I had to take you out of the sport where you knew everybody, you knew how it worked, you knew all the lakes to go to, you knew the sponsors to call, and you were using your name. I needed you to go to a land that you didn't know, so you learned how to rest in me, and the only name you got is Jesus. It's Jesus. I didn't fit in that land. Even today, people go, people listen to you? I mean, they say it just like that, like... They asked my team members, like, what does she say? Like, I don't do anything but show up. And the Lord does the rest. And so when that invitation came to go to prison, here's how it happened. I wish I could, could I need to, oh, yeah, there we are in prison. You're good back there, wherever you are. So there was a man on the video earlier, and I'm going to snapshot that one day and have it up there. But. My husband and I were kissing in the video because we had just, we, we, I say we, had just won. And there was a man standing behind like this. And one day I was sitting in prison watching that video before I came up and I was like, Bill's in this video. Bill is the one God used to get me to prison. Bill was a professional boat driver. I knew him from this world, from the water ski world. And so he was standing there, because I was the last person to ski, waiting to get into the wakeboard boat so that he could drive. And so what happened is Bill gets arrested and gets sent away for 15 years. And I, just like everybody else in our sport, went like this. Bill had come up and, and shared his testimony occasionally on stage. We would have church under the Bud Light tent before the events would start. And guess what? God met us there. God met us there because two or more were gathered in his name. We weren't there drinking and partying. We were there, but we also weren't in our dresses. We were in bathing suit shorts and tops, and, you know, there we were, respectful, but just learning from each other. And it was there that this Baptist girl realized that other denominations were going to heaven <laughs> because I met Lutherans that loved the Lord, Catholics that loved the Lord. I met... Pentecostals that love the Lord. I met Methodists that love the Lord. And there we were. And I realized, we all love Jesus. And, it, and that's where we were meeting together. We worship a little different. We do things a little different. But it was about Jesus. And it was about sharing his word and coming together because we traveled all the time. Well, Bill goes away and I distanced myself and even denied really knowing him because it was harming our ministry and I thought I got to protect what God gave me 
He went away for seven, 15 years, but seven years in, he wrote me a letter. I didn't even remember his name when I saw it because it said William. And then it had the rest of his name. It had a hashtag with all these numbers. I had no idea what those numbers meant. That was his DOC number. His federal, actually his BOP number. He was in the federal system. And so I read this. And the first line is, I am so sorry for the harm I caused your ministry. And my heart broke. I wasn't mad at Bill. I'd just forgotten about Bill. I never really thought bad about Bill. I was just, I got to protect what God gave me. Never once thinking, what would God have me do towards Bill? Because I ran from him instead of run to him. And seven years in, with that letter in my hands, I received an invitation from the Lord to go remember the prisoner. And so I told my husband, I let him read the letter. I said, baby, can I go visit another man in prison? <laughs> and he, I have a really amazing husband who has always honored the call of God. And it has been a call on our whole family. I have a husband whose ministry is he loves to serve, serve others, serve our kids, serve my parents while I'm gone. He's going to ball games with them and going to dinner with them and hanging out with them. And it's just amazing. And so Tim said, yes. And so I go and I visit Bill and I'm in this room and it's a reception room. It took me a couple of times to get through the gate because... I didn't know what you could carry in. I didn't know anything. And I even asked this lady sitting there. I'm like, are you here visiting someone? What a dumb question. <laughs> Is she just sitting in the visitation room on a Saturday for the kicks? I don't think so. She goes, yeah, I'm here to visit my son. He's almost out. I said, oh, that's great. I'm thinking like next week. She goes, only two and a half more years. And she drove every weekend from Orlando to Miami to see her baby. And I was behind her walking in a single file line to the reception room. And God is moving. And it was not indigestion. I knew he was showing me something. Bill was just talking a mile a minute because he hadn't had a visitor in so long. Because he's from Texas. He had also been a cop. So they had shipped him way off. So that no one he put away would get him. So he had nobody visit him. In 15 years, I think there was like eight visits. And I was like three of them. And so while I'm talking with Bill, the Lord's, I'm talking with the Lord. You can do that. You can be asking the Lord some questions internally. And he will answer you. There will be a conversation going on. I love Nehemiah. He, he, the, the king said something and Nehemiah didn't know what to say. So he says, I prayed and then I answered. It could be that fast. Lord, give me the words. That's what I say before I come up here. I don't know what I'm going to say. Lord, give me the words. You know what somebody out there needs to hear. And so I heard the Lord say, look around you. What do you see? First thing I saw was the excitement in Bill's face, the love that he had for me and appreciation that he had just for me to show up, the power of a visit, the power of remembering the prisoner because he was tired, he was weary, and he needed an encouragement. I also looked around and what I saw were, were dads holding their babies. I saw dads with their angry teenage sons who did not want to be there visiting dad again in prison. I was like, wow, that's a dynamic that's got to be difficult for the family. I didn't realize that when someone was incarcerated, the whole family was incarcerated. Yeah. And so the Lord very clearly spoke to me. He says, this is where I'm sending you. And I really didn't have a but God moment. All I said was, yes. But if you want me to go, you got to put me there because I get ahead of you all the time. And a skier ahead of a boat, what happens? You sink. And I had been doing that for so long. I was, had been so sick. And I was like, I don't even trust myself with this. 
This is a different call. It's a big call. If you want me there, I will go. I left there knowing God was calling me to go remind people that they were seen. They were loved. They were still chosen. God was still inviting them out on the water to walk, to experience miracles, to be used. That it wasn't over. The dreams weren't over just because something was different than what they had expected in life. And so I said, yes, God, but you open the doors. Now, I don't, now for some people, I don't want you to use that excuse. Well, I'm just going to sit back and just wait, 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 wait. I had already been walking with God. I'd already been getting off the dock, and I knew my pitfall here. I said, Lord, I'm going to wait for you to move on this one. I'm going to wait for you to open the door, and when you do, I'm walking through. He waited about a week, and he sent this magazine. And I brought all of you. We got copies back there. Um, I had been publishing this magazine for two years, not knowing why. God had put on my heart, tell people's God stories. Let everybody know that no matter what's going on, that God is there. He can help you. He's the answer. And so I had started doing this. Even my kids would say, Mama, why are you spending all that time? Nobody wants that magazine. Magazine industry is dead. And God's calling me to print a magazine. It's expensive. And then, not sell it, give it away. So I started where I was. I put it on churches around my one stop like town with a, with a population of about three, 4,000. And I'm going to start right here. And what the Lord did is when I said yes, somehow he, he floated this thing on up to Tallahassee. I didn't tell anybody. I told the Lord. The Lord put this in the hands of the DOC in Florida. The DOC calls me a week later and says, Hello, Miss Johnson, we just got your magazine, Victorious Living, and we would like it in every facility in the state of Florida. The next week, Miss Johnson, we hear you speak in prisons. I don't. Would you come do our, our graduation service at Lancaster? Bill Glass Ministries out of Dallas, Texas, the next week. Hi, Miss Johnson, we hear you go in prison yards, and we want you to be our platform speaker. We bring a lot of athletes in, pro athletes, as a draw them to the yard, and, and you just deliver your story, and then we got a team that's going to lead them to Jesus. And so all of a sudden, phone rings. It's Jack Murphy, Murph the Surf, pulled off the largest jewel heist in American history. God saved him in prison, and now he's passed now during COVID, but he's like, I said, Godfather of prison ministry. He'd worked with Chuck Colson. He had been an executive director at Bill Glass at Prison Fellowship. And that's who God sends me to be my spiritual father, to teach me. And he says, I put this man in your life, learn from him. So I say this to say, whatever it is God is calling you to, you can lay the excuses aside because he's not looking for you to have the for you to fit. For you to have like all the answers, all the know-how. The Lord says, you don't know this land. I can't walk up to a prison and say, let me in. I'm a professional water skier. <laughs> they slam the door. It takes months of preparation for me to be able to go in these places across the United States. So God sends this all over the U.S. He's sending it even internationally. It's Him. All He needs is your yes. He opened up, so COVID shuts everything down, stops visitation. You know what they needed then? Publications. We went from 100 and some facilities across the U.S. to 3,000 because everything shut down and what the enemy meant for evil, God used for good. You know what entered the tablets? What entered the prisons in 2020? Tablets. Last year alone, 2.4 million people watched my teaching videos in prison. It's crazy. Podcast. We have trauma-informed care. We do prison events all over. Y'all would have missed it. Missed it if I hadn't gone to visit. And God used one man 
Bill, a man everybody turned his back on. Bill had the courage to reach out and put himself out there. You might be the Bill that God wants to use. Someone may have already approached you and invited you somewhere and you're saying, no, I can't. I can't speak. I can't do this. God just wants your yes. I also could have missed it because I didn't want to let go of the good thing called in his wakes. And I had founded it. It was my baby. It was fruitful. There was, I don't know if you've ever heard Henry Clown, Cloud, Clouds, not a clown, Dr. Henry Cloud's Necessary Endings. There was a necessary ending there. Just like a rose bush has to be pruned. And the good flowers have to go off so the magnificent ones can bloom. And so don't miss it. God's got an adventure out on that water. And he's just waiting for you to say, hit it, God. You can trust me. But God shows up. He's always there. But he manifests through your faith. You step off, he catches you. You step out, the money's there. So many ministries, they're like, we can't do it. We can't do it because we don't have it in our budget. We don't have the money yet. When I go to press, it's $60,000 every quarter. And I'm looking at that, that bank account, and it's not there. But I know people are on the other side are waiting for the gospel that's contained in these pages. And this is going to save their life because it has truth. The way, the truth, and the life is on every page. So if God's calling you out, and I know he is because every one of you, no matter what your age, no matter what your condition, God will use you. God will use you because you're chosen. You're not appointed by man. He'll use the good things in your life, the traumatic things in your life, the mistakes in your life, and he takes it all and he works it together for good to this beautiful mosaic. And the glory of God, like a stained glass, his light shines through it, and they can't help but look at you and say, look what God has done. Look what God has done in you, sir. Look what God has done. Think of that song. Look what the Lord has done. I bet y'all sing that here. Come on up, Pastor. Thank y'all for having me. Listen, we got a gift for y'all back there. Come back and get it. Stay right here, Christian. Come on. Let her know you appreciate the work that she is doing. Romans 4, 17 says this. In the presence of God, he gives life to the dead and he speaks the things that are not as though they were. That is a prophetic statement. But God uses the performance of his people to carry out his prophecies. Yes. And here's what we're going to do. I think this church, this is one of the most giving churches. So we're not having to worry about whether or not we're going to take up an offering to meet her needs and her expenses. We got that taken care of. But she said those tablets, over 2 million hits, people watching it. It's my understanding from Pat Avery, and you helped me with this. You're your great assistant that I've been talking to. That to get one episode or one podcast is like $12,000 or something like that. No, to, we have monthly fees that we have to pay to be on there. To do like one Spanish translation video is $1,000. Okay, one Spanish translation, $1,000. So let's do this. These are $1. Those are a buck. Maybe we'll send them. Yeah. And those. all of these prisons want you to have how many hundreds of thousands? We, we send in at the moment 250000 a year. Um, and she's they get already, rotated. She's already beaten me. Thank you. I want you to prophetically be the performer of from this church for Victorious Living Magazine, for the iP iPad tablet uh, ministry, prison or events. whatever the prison ministry that they need to do in order to get the information to them. All of these events, 
workshops. Let's help her ministry. Let's help her do the work. And I'm going to ask you that when you are waiting on what, how God's going to see your purpose materialize, we heard in a, in, in a 45 minute span actually a 35 or 40 year walk. 50 some year oh, walk. Oh, I, I wasn't going to go there. I know better. I tried to undershoot. No, just... I start celebrating every year now. <laughs> <laughs> but to get to her purpose. And here's what I want you to know. Is that a God moment came to me in the women's conference. When for no other reason than people were called to get a gift. There were gifts all over the cross of the stage. And they would call out someone by number. And that person had the bravery to stand up and go get their gift. Well, as soon as that happened, everybody started clapping. And, and I grinned and I thought, that person, that whole group of ladies are clapping for that person for no reason. That person didn't really do anything but just get up and walk to the front. And they all clapped. And you know what? That's exactly what the Lord did for each and every one of us when we knelt at an altar one day. For no reason, all of heaven rejoiced because we accepted the call. And here is your purpose while you're waiting and it becomes to materialize. What you've done is invest. And I don't know how much this is or how far it will go. They'll be able to figure that out. But I do know this. There might be a bill that's waiting. I know that the prison that she was in this past week that she talked to the men, my own cousin was there, and I didn't know it. Some six, eight months ago, I went and got to meet him for the first time in prison. We fast forward real quick. I talked to him. He would text me. He got a car. He got out. Everything was, God is doing great. Then I get a message. My cousin has passed away. Within two months of him getting out of prison, he passed away. But not without knowing Jesus Amen. Christ as his Savior. Amen. Not Amen. without knowing Christ. So I get to see my cousin again. So I just want to thank you for giving. And, and Christy, I, I just want to say we thank you, thank you for sharing your heart and life with us. And will you, church, continue to support? We do monthly with the magazine, but you can continue to support. Go out there and meet her at the table, and they'll be glad to see you there. God bless you. We love you. Go in the presence of the Lord and be free in Jesus' name.